Hello, 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 hello. That's good. It's working. So could could Team Nook join us at the front? That would be <laughs> Team Nook. So so we've thinned out a little bit, so please join us. microphone a second and I'll just can you go oh yeah the display port thing yeah yeah it should work there there Okay, so um, this is from what I was talking about earlier about um, wanting to find out um, about the mobile network coverage on um, the road network. Um, if you are primarily from the point of view of the new e-call thing that's coming in in new cars, that a uh, new car will have a SIM card and if your airbag goes off, it will call emergency services and they'll there'll be a voice in your car that says, hey, are you okay? Do you need help? And if there's no response, they'll call and uh, send an ambulance. And if you respond and say, yes, I need help, they'll send an ambulance. Um, so we, um, I've been using breakdown data, um, RAC motoring services breakdown data, um, and I have the location and the time that these breakdowns are happening. And also, so these are all the orange and blue spots uh, so the, it says, uh, the blue ones are when they didn't use a mobile phone to call, and the orange ones are where they did use a mobile phone to call. Um, and we spent quite a lot of time trying to find some parts of the mobile network that are areas where there are no mobile reception, so the not spots um, are the yellow parts of this. Oops these, um, and then the green and red are the partial spots um, to see in those places whether people were able to use their mobile phones. Um, so where there's an orange one inside a yellow part here, this is the location of the breakdown. So that person did a lot, probably did a lot of moving around to find somewhere where he could actually make a phone call from to get motoring services to come and get him. Uh, or her, um, but yeah, so this is like the start of trying to look at, I also have, and I'm not sure if you can see them anywhere on this part of the map, I have, oh you can, I can see one. These pink dots 
are the emergency call points that are along the motorways, the orange boxes on the side of the roads. Um, so I wanted to see if people on the roads uh, kind of around them were using these emergency call points when if there were not spots, but we haven't found anywhere where all that collided yet. Uh, but yeah, that's the sort of thing that interested me. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> yeah. Uh, questions? Yes. Yes? Oh. <laughs> Andrew Bunn, Ofcom. Uh, so was this useful? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if we could have all the data, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, generally, I, I presumably there's a there's a just a, a high level piece of analysis. I mean, the map is great, but presumably you could then take this and do some further correlation work Absolutely. or something to, yeah. to to identify if there's partic particular mm -hmm. issues and 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 the value of this would be uh, sort of prompt you. What, what's the value? I mean. What, what would change as a result of this? Um, well, <laughs> um, basically, it, it would be good for Highways England um, if they decide, oh, we've got e-call now, we're just not going to bother repairing our um, so phone points on the side of the road, um, okay. emergency call points on the side of the road, and, yeah, in putting pressure on um, the powers that be to make sure that this coverage is improved. Um, and we were talking ultimately about like where the future is going. So this emergency calls are 2G, um, but autonomous and connected vehicles are coming and the car manufacturers want to have SIM cards for all sorts of other manner of things in their vehicles. So they'll want 5G coverage all yeah. over the road network so yeah. they can, I don't know, if you have an autonomous, autonomous car and they want you buying stuff while you're in the car or advertising stuff at you, they'll, they'll want all this. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's where I guess it's going. Um, yeah, thanks very much, it's really exciting. Did you say that the one colour of spot is where a breakdown wasn't reported by a mobile phone call? Uh, so the blue ones are where mobile phones weren't used. How did you find out about those? Uh, so when, when I uh, asked the RIC for this data, I said, can you tell me whether uh, the call was made using a mobile phone or not. Well, how did the RSC find out about those breakdowns? If oh, because they um, collect the contact number for the person, so they can they know if the number is a mobile. So I don't so have the numbers, but I know. That no, so they've gone. They've like they've knocked on a door or something like that. Like how, if you haven't got a mobile with you, how do you report? Oh, um, so I guess they're using. Uh, like landlines or I don't know so yeah. they, the column I asked for is literally mobile phone use yes no so I don't know what in their data set the other yeah. options are so it would be yeah. landline, oh, la landlines or the out. emergency call yeah, points yeah. or stuff like that yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah because it, it was just a surprise to see all the places where the phone mobile wasn't used even though it looks like we've got good Coverage. Oh, I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah. Uh, so it's just no, a mobile wasn't used. It's not no, a mo mobile couldn't be used. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, like, this is a residential area, so these people are probably yeah. coming out to their cars in the morning and yeah, finding yeah. they won't start, so they're using their house phone yeah. to call, whereas there's some of them using their mobiles because everyone has a mobile these yeah, days. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? This is amazing. It's been a couple of hours, that? Yeah. And what could you do really if you useful. had the data for the whole of the country released? Um, ideally, we would like to do an update on a report that we did um, a couple of years ago that looked at the miles of the road network that doesn't have the coverage um, and at different levels. So we did it for 2G, 3G and 4G. Um, and obviously we wanted to improve and it is improving, which is really, really good. So if we can say that 0% of the yep. road network has uh, no not spots. That would be amazing. And wouldn't it be amazing if, uh, how far do you um, live from the South Bank? Or how far is the RAC's offices from the South Bank? Um, 
like a five minute walk. A five minute walk. So maybe there's a collaboration to be had <laughs> uh, where you could look at the data yeah. and then present it and you might not just have to publish the data to do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. We so a regulator and a registered charity that. looking after data for motorists. <laughs> I think there's a collaboration somewhere in there to be to be looked after. So I'll, I'll leave it with you guys to, to mm -hmm. do that next, that next step. Sorry? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lara, Lara. Anyway, um, yeah. So thanks very much. Yes. Big round of applause Thank for you. that. So uh, I think Tom and Dan are still working on their thing. So uh, Giles, do you just want to give us an update from your team? Yeah. Brilliant. Well done. I'll plug in my laptop. Thank you. And then yeah. I'm not going to not going to launch into a song now, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we are. Uh, so Giles has joined the choir, and that's why he's the chorister. Uh, uh, have you been to practice yet? Yes. How many times? Just the once. Well, Got another another one tomorrow night. So he's been to he's been to choir practice once. It's uh, so it's uh, uh, so I live in Hebden Bridge, and last year they they ran a pop choir. So there's uh, there's um. If you know Hebden Bridge, of course. Of course they, they did, yeah, yeah. yeah. As one, one of the, um, this is very interesting for the live stream, isn't it? Uh, one of the uh, that folk I know there is a quite a talented arranger, so she comes up with arrangements of all sorts of crazy pop songs. So, so where, where do you want to be? I'm right near the bottom. I can find it if you like, Paul, because I'm, I'm quite capable of so scrolling down. So we, we had a look at consumers and realised, as we were talking about it, that actually that's um, an overloaded term. So we could mean, so there's, there's a little bit of there we go, me, me being a chorister, there's, there's the initial post-it notes we had a look at. Um, so consumer being an overloaded term. So there's, there are two types of consumers we're interested in. We've got the end users of the service that are being regulated. So we were thinking particularly about uh, mobile and broadband. Um, but also, uh, if we're talking about being publishers of data, API or you know, whatever, then uh, there, is the, there are the consumers of the data. We had a little bit of discussion about both. Focus probably more on the, uh, the, the end users, if you like, so the, um, so the, the, the people with the, with the broadband or the, or the mobile phone uh, contracts. Um, so the question, the question we raised around those was, well, what do they actually want to know? And, and ultimately, it comes down to how fast is my network going to be? If I'm thinking about switching, or if I've got a problem with my current provider and I want to you know, rake them over the coals, or if I'm moving house, and, and that might be from two perspectives, A, you know, I'd like to know what I'm, gonna, what I'm buying into, and, or maybe it's so important that I've got good connectivity um, that, I'm, that I don't want to move into an area that's got you know, problems. So, so that's quite, you know, it's got an important set of data there. Um, but more than just that, it's not just about what's, you know, what's the published capability, but it's also, the experience of using that service. So, you know, the, the example that was given during the presentations and we talked about a bit more was what's the experience of using a mobile phone in a given area? For example, when I go into my house, because it's a you know, Cotswold cottage with, you know, 13 foot walls, 13 foot thick walls, suddenly I drop, my phone signal drops off. Is that, a, is that a factor? How could we actually augment the data that we've got and we publish now to, um, uh, to, to report that? Uh, but there's a bit of an issue in that, in that if we are, if we're publishing that data and we, you know, we give you more and more and more information about it, there is a point at which we end up, oh, hello, Anonymous Wolf is doing something. Hello. This is good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What am I supposed to be saying now? Uh, okay. Um, it's really good, that. Um, <laughs> it's being rewritten under me as I've, I've been live, live coding. Um, okay, so um, so the more, more and more data we pile into this information, the, the more confusing it could get, and there's a gap between the data presented and the, and the understanding of those users. So we just need to be aware of that. Um, there was some thought about whether we could publish... Um, uh, sort of ratings along along the scale of energy ratings, you know, the sort of the A, A plus, A plus plus, the green, you know, the, the red to green kind of marking about how good 
broadband is, making it a really simple kind of graphic. Um, uh, that's certainly feasible. Um, you know, as you as you start to get reports about um, about cap uh, coverage in a in a given area, then you could start to do that. The, the big issue I highlighted there was new builds, and we had a bit of a talk about the fact that you know br broadband seems to be a bit hit, hit and miss when we're looking at uh, hit looking at uh, new builds uh, and estates where you get half the houses can get certain types of coverage and others can't. So all sorts of issues associated with that. And this, this led us towards an idea that we came up with, which was a small box that you could sit in your house, which would, uh, which would report your, your sort of um, broadband health, so you plug it in, um, uh, uh, sort of a, as a means of reporting on the actual service you're experiencing. So, you know, you get your reported 80, 80 meg download, but actually, you know, you only get that 20% of the time, and then the network drops out every every... Friday afternoon when, when somebody unplugs the, your box at the exchange or whatever it happens to be. Uh, we went a bit further, and we, so we, w we worried a little about the, v the VW effect. So if it became known that this is what was happening, then providers could you know, start prioritizing that traffic and all sorts of issues like that. Um, it's kind of similar to s the smart metering idea, giving people more information about their, their, um, their, uh, their, their broadband um, capability. Um, Interesting to think about what the benefit might be, though. So it's all very well having the information. What are you going to do with that? So there's a little bit more thought required around there. Uh, but I did like the idea of having a big red button on the top of it. So every time your broadband starts breaking, you just hit it. You know, that's another useful source of information about uh, about service capability and service um, ability, as well as being very cathartic. As your broadband drops off, you can hit something. Um, we did a little bit of um, value mapping, working out, you know, so data is being published to these end users, but they're also a source of data. And we had a bit of discussion around um, around complaint data. My initial idea was we could use that as a as a source of, um, uh, you know, to sort of sort of work out what kind of service was being provided. Um, it became apparent that actually that's a far more complex set of interactions than, than I'd originally thought because there's multiple people that you can complain to. Obviously, it's only the more, mo more serious ones that really get to ombudsman level, which is probably, you know, but it's, but it's uh, interesting to sort of think through that. But this, this was quite kind of useful in that it started to sort of demonstrate the kind of networks of data flowing around and, you know, by closing a few of these loops. So feeding some of this stuff back from the ombudsman back to Ofcom, which, which happens anyway, but is there a way that we can we can take that and, and, and sort of report it report it back in a in a useful form. Um, uh, we had a little bit of a talk about um, uh, about other consumers of Ofcom data and, and, and the idea of using a design centered approach uh, to to that. So sort of um, user research, prototyping, user testing, and and that iterative loop, which is kind of good practice really. If you if you're publishing data, getting that feedback about how people are using it, how they want to use it. Um, uh, I don't know what the next thing is about because I didn't type that, so I can't. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. It looks like a good idea, though. <coughs> uh, right. Uh, then there was a bunch of discussion about address level data, um, and um, the the desire that Ofcom has to publish that, and some of the some of the uh, the, the challenges around that. Um, there were a couple of guys re re representing uh, price comparison uh, sites in there. Um, and the challenge uh, laid down by Liz was, okay, if we publish this, what would you want to use it for? And, and you know, hopefully as a means of form forming that dialogue um, and, um, you know, just try to capture some of the issues around around publishing that data from the operator perspective, which interestingly is very similar to the sorts of concerns we hear about in all sorts of other domains of data publishing, um, uh, sort of travel data, transport data. All very similar. Batteries running low, Paul. I know the feeling. Uh, so that was it. So quite a quite a broad ranging uh, discussion. Um, a few kind of insights and a few a few thoughts to to develop, um, but uh, but but interesting. Um, any questions? You'll have to hand the microphone around yourself because I'm not there to do it. No, still in silence. Thank you.
Okay, so we have live demo. Slow down a bit. Pass my, um, that longer. Mm -hmm. Over to you, Dan. Thank you. Um, so today we've been looking at how we can better visualize the data that or open data that already exists on the Ofcom site. So we looked at the latest uh, Connected Nations report and then took the broadband speeds uh, by postcode and then did some uh, crunch number crunching to show how we can represent it at different geographical levels. So. Uh, at ODR Leeds, we do a few of these hex map type things, and it's a good way of uh, getting rid of sort of the um, effects of, imagine if you were looking at a, uh, for example, the election maps, certain larger areas sort of draw your eye more. So often it can appear, so there's more blue for a conservative victory in sort of rural areas that are large. But if you reduce it all so that each unit is a individual hexagon, it better shows up local variations so if I just pick a region, I can zoom in, oops, and this is at a local authority level in, oh, that's York, go back, that's Yorkshire and the Humber at a local authority level. And you see, I guess these are typically more rural areas here, have a slower uh, broadband speed on average. And if we want to go into a ward level, we can click on the individual local authority and get a different view and maybe pick somewhere else London for example it's interesting actually there seems to be quite slower speeds on average in right in the center of London can go in a bit deeper maybe to see the individual areas that are showing a slower than average broadband speed. Uh, any questions or any areas anybody wants to look at? Pardon? Oh yeah, the whole of them. Those administrative areas you've got there. Yeah, these are wards, ward level. So ward level, yeah. Yeah, so we took all the postcode data and converted each postcode to its um, ward that it was a member of and then averaged out all the broadband speeds. Oh, so yeah, the average of the median broadband speed. Yeah. So we've, we've got that for the whole country now? Yes, yes, so anybody can go on and just. And you can see the islands have very slow broadband. Um, I'm sorry for sending it. Could you easily um, do 2016 and then do the delta? 
Yeah, we've done that. Uh, use hex maps to look at uh, employment data and different sequences and mm -hmm. uh, percentage increases, decreases over the years. And if we had um, that sounds good. And if we had uh, a dress level, you know, the really granular stuff, is that something you can use this technique for, or is this more for aggregated? Uh, it's more for aggregating sort mm -hmm. of uh, larger. Yeah, yeah, I guess, an, a larger aggregation rather than individual points. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? I've heard a lot of these things of... Um, Shall we have a look? Fantastic. Round of applause. Yeah. And, and, be, and before you go, are there, are there any of the favourite parts of the country that people would like to just check out? Is there Hometown. Hometowns or places you get the most complaints of from Ofcom? So for me, this, this, is, this is fantastic. Um, I, I think for Ofcom, it'd be great to see this as an example of how the, um, the Connected Nations report could look um, with a, uh, some data that powered some um, tools on top of it. Um, and then with um, changes over time, with a continuous delivery of data behind it, that means it's just always up to date and you can then see what's happening um, and we have machines taking the big heavy lifting for doing the report and people um, doing the insight on top. Um, so this is a great example of what could be done. Um, and then now that this data has been updated, we could set this to automatically uh, update from an API. So let's give Dan a, a round of applause for this bit. And Tom. Yep, so it's the full. Um, oh. Usually, they usually we can squeeze in. Wales is never a problem. Scotland takes a few extra hours, and yep. Northern Ireland is just a world pain. This has got Northern Yep, which is which is great. So, um, so Rich and Max, you were looking at what the should, an API should include. So, if you can just give us a couple of minutes on that, and if if we get it. You can describe your API, and then we can have many more services like this that are built on top of it. Ready to go. Cheers. Um, so, the open day stuff, stuff uh, maybe if you tackle that, but. Um, we were just discussing the, possibi the possibilities if we were to uh, release an API and, and what, what kind of data we'd be able to uh, release, but also some of the benefits that I actually hadn't considered. Um, so uh, as well as the benefits of releasing data via an API being uh, significant for uh, the market and consumers, um, it also potentially could reduce workloads within Ofcom, um, on Andrew especially, um, if people were able to use it to use the data internally. Um, 
the we we talked about different um, potential ways to cover infrastructure costs um, that have been used elsewhere. So um, monetization of uh, not unlimited API, whereas there could be a rate limited version for sort of academic uses uh, and studies. Um, or different service level agreements for different users with different charges, some free, some not. Um, we then talked about the definitions of um, the metrics and keeping them consistent and the core data sets remaining consistent over years instead of uh, rapidly changing how we uh, define our metrics, um, which is something that's quite easy to do in such a fast changing market. Um, and then we talked uh, somewhat about documentation of uh, the data and metrics needing to be really clear for users um, and keeping it regularly updated, uh, which was important. And then we also talked about how within the API, some of the definitions of the data might have to be fixed to maintain um, some level of control over the definitions of things such as good, poor, and no coverage. Um, we wouldn't necessarily want uh, different stakeholders using different definitions and confusing the uh, metrics. Um, and then the, the, the remainder of the discussion was mainly around open data stuff, so maybe if you want to cover that quickly. Thanks, Max. So it was great seeing the hex maps and seeing the power of visualization to just get the minds whirring and, and the engagement going up. So uh, hopefully that's uh, what I will continue, the, the, the theme really. I mean, Open Data Soft is a platform for visualizing and sharing data. So if I show you, I'm just going to duck into the, some of you will have seen a bit of this because uh, I did the rounds on a few tables. But to get a few points across, this is a demo that we created for the West Midlands region. If Am I talking too loud? I'm a bit enthusiastic about the uh, microphone. Um, so this was an example of how you've got the public and private working together. This is a demo, but um, the multi-agency partnership in the West Midlands area where you've got uh, people like Amy who are delivering the services to the council. You've got the council. You've got people like Highways England and uh, universities and SMEs all working together and uh, thinking about things like congestion and, and big uh, roadworks going on for the next 15-odd years. So the ability to get that data out, this is being used by SMEs and universities to actually access data via the API. Uh, so I know people were talking about we need an API, we need a modern API. What we do here is the ability to have, you can see on the left hand side, there's data from various different publishers. So there's the City Council, but then there's also Highways England, AME, Department of Transport and so on. So that might be your equivalent of Ofcom plus uh, ONS plus OS, et cetera. There can be various different third parties contributing data. Obviously, the platform doesn't care about which of those organizations uh, the data is coming from in the sense of having one place to navigate through the data. So there's an API for the whole unified platform, but there's also an API feed for every single individual data set. So if I was to go into, for example, this Roadworks data, which comes from Elgin, which is the main uh, sort of UK roadworks uh, provider we have various different views so this is a, a sort of table view uh, where you can see there's a number of different uh, columns things like oh here goes non mac navigation Let's see if i can do this yes um various fields like traffic management uh, traffic impact which are also on the left hand side ways that we can search through the data so if we just want to go for I want to look for road closures. We can skip straight to that. So I'll do that. And again, back to what people have been talking about a lot today is going to the the area that someone might be living in or interested in. I mean, in this case, we can go down to road level. Uh, I've got it on a table view at the moment, but if I bring that onto a map view, I've drilled it right down so I can have a look at the road closure on that particular destination but I can also um, clear all that and you can see we start to get visualizations where um, get rid of that we can actually see the concentration a lot more easily and then start zooming in and it's all designed to be very intuitive 
So the idea being, from a consumer's point of view, they can also digest this data in a kind of easy way uh, and, and get something that is meaningful, but also then it's accessible, but also shareable. So this particular view that I've got in underneath here, so my hesitation is I, I normally get my, uh, my mouse going downwards and this is going upwards, so uh, anyway. Uh, you can share it via a URL at the bottom or an embed code or a widget, so it's very uh, shareable and easy for, for people to also put that into other websites or, or dashboards and so on. So the API point there, there's also uh, search functionality. So often you know, people will go to some of these like even data.gov.uk and it's not really that easily searchable in search searchability of the API. So if people are wanting to try and build innovative services, they're not really tending to do that via things like uh, data.gov at the moment. So this would enable, uh, if I jump into the other example I was going to show, if I show you a bit about ANFR who are also using this uh, platform, a lot of, a lot of cases uh, people use the data, ah, we're going to get a French lesson now, uh, norm oh, okay, we'll translate it, let's see. Um, Normally, organizations will use this on an open data, or quite often they'll use it on an open data level, but also for internal uses, so, or, and also shared uses. So it could be that it's Ofcom employees, it could be it's across the ecosystem of engineers and people who sort of understand some of the more technical stuff, or it could be uh, you know, people who are just able to be general public. So ANFR are publishing data like antennas. Um, they also, on an internal basis, they actually use the API for um, doing some innovative services around, it's a bit beyond me, the actual uh, story I was told about this, but if you understand what uh, beacon signals on boats and something to do with locks and, and unlocking, so I think that they were doing some route planning so the boats could decide if they were gonna hold back because they would get better signals. It was basically being able to, in real time, be able to get some visibility of, of how they might move and, and make decisions basically um, but what they're uh, doing on an open level is publishing antenna data around 2g 3g 4g um, this is on the home page if i go to the actual data cards i'll just show you that in a little bit more detail so again we've got the same sort of format of being able to navigate through the different filters. Um, everything is downloadable in all the different formats. People are asking about JSON and XLS and uh, XML and all, all of the different uh, sort of standard formats. That's all available. Uh, but if we go into that 3G and 4G view, we'll see again, we'll have a instant sort of map view, which is quite international. And again, on the left-hand side, we can see various different ways of navigating that, whether it's by region, by department, the kind of uh, whether the facilities are uh, concerned or not concerned, etc. cetera. Um, and also break down by 3G, 4G, uh, 2G. The other last point I was gonna make was about just layering data. So we talked in different groups about how you can start to get more insight. I'm just gonna show you quickly a, a Bristol City Council use us. So if you've got any data in a platform, there is the ability to start layering that, whether it's in a graph view, so you could start building out. And this is, if you're an, a citizen, you know, uh, using this on an open data basis, or if you're any, anyone of more uh, sort of professional capability. But in this case, I'm going to show you the map example. So if I just add a data set, that's now going to give me all of the different data sets that Bristol Council have published, 82. Um, so I could, for example, select, uh, let's do street lights. So again, we've got a view there. And I think I showed you earlier, you can drill into the, uh, the actual view and, and uh, see that a little bit more clearly. But in this case, I just want to uh, show you how you can layer stuff. So let's just go back. It gets to the point I was saying to Michael earlier on, you know, that, that 
the technology will enable anything really at this level, but it, it, it certainly it, it can streamline the internal processes of gathering data and structuring it and then processing it. So from a data management point of view, it's quick and easy, but then it gives you the flexibility of then thinking creatively about, you know, I think we all kind of wonder about what would be the data sets that we would combine that would be really useful. And so it gives a bit more uh, time for people to actually think through what those things would be. So if I add in, I just want to just get the point across. If I do cycle shops, now I might not like the view of that so much. So again, it's kind of editable. I make make it dots. That's a bit easier on the eye. And then I might just layer on on top of that. Let's just do a quick one just for the sake of uh, recycling banks. Not that great as a data combination, but for speed. And again, oh it can change the colors and et cetera, et cetera. But it's just to show you how you can play about with the data. And, and I think someone in the room maybe said it was, some, oh I can't remember the quote, but it's the idea of this being fun. You know, it's kind of put it in the hands of someone and they can actually have some fun with this stuff and, and play about with it. I think that's maybe it, there was a concern I, I think picked up on this morning around what can we do for the end consumers. And if we can sometimes give them, certainly the developer community, if we can give them everything and then an easy way for them to actually combine the data and create visualizations, then they'll probably show us things that we hadn't uh, thought about ourselves. Yeah? Any questions? Thanks, Carl. Yep. Welcome. So my, my important takeaway from that is uh, there's, there's uh, make it fun, people are interested. So is it ANFR in France? They've made spectrum mapping fun, apparently, but that's that's amazing, and it is true. Um, but also, um, making things open is usually of benefit to the organisation itself first, and in spades, uh, rather than the um, the demand to show a business case and the ROI on the investment externally. And what people will say usually is, why, why should we publish it? Who will it benefit? Show me three or four use cases outside of our organization to demonstrate it, when usually the first ones are, it will benefit us internally first, we'll be able to move faster, we'll share things better, and it will make things easier within the organization. So that's, that's, the, that's a real key point to, to take away from, from that. But also, tools like this exist where we don't have to build anything new we can deploy what exists, and it makes things easier to to uh, to deploy. So that's great. So I think that's it. Was was there anything else we needed to talk about? I know people. We, people have been filtering off all afternoon, and we're, we're we're about half the size we were when we started, which is amazing. Um, but I think we've also got some people who need to go for a train. Right. Yeah, you absolutely do need to do that because, well, otherwise you'd have to go to the pub, wouldn't you? But yeah, yeah. So, so it just leads me to say thank you very much for everyone for coming. I think we got some really good outputs uh, from today. Um, the the next steps will be will be writing this up, but it will be on the same web page, so there'll be nothing separate, nothing will be d d um, displayed. It was all on the ODI leads slash events slash Ofcom um, outputs. All of the slides from today are on there all of the videos on there today, the pictures that will be on there. So all of the assets are there for anybody to use um, and for you to share internally and externally within um, Ofcom and external to Ofcom. So I think we should close it there, give ourselves a round of applause. Um, and then we'll be doing some follow-up. Um, we'll, everyone who's been involved will email them with the, the links to the, um, the web page and also uh, we'll be working with Ofcom with a little bit of follow-up blog and saying this is what happened and this is what we're going to do next. So um, thank you very much. And whoever needs to go for the train.